Hi, this is Deboki, and today I'm going to be doing my reading wrap-up for the month of August. I read seven books in the month of August, which I feel like is pretty good, so let's just get started. First two books I'm going to talk about are going to be collected issues of comic books. The first is Cinderella Volume 1 from Fable Town with Love, and this was written by Chris Robertson and illustrated by Sean McManus. This comic book is part of this Fable series, which revolves around a community called Fable Town that is populated with characters from fairy tales and folk tales. The community Fable Town is kept secret from regular people called Mondays, and this book in particular is about Cinderella, a divorcee socialite who leads a secret life as a spy. In this story, she gets sent off on a mission to find magical items that are illegally being sold off to Mondays, which leads her to Dubai and a rendezvous with Aladdin. I read this book because I saw it in a Book Riot list of books to read. If you really enjoy Atomic Blonde, but I didn't really like this book, and I should have expected that because I've never really been able to get into fables overall. I love retellings and adaptations of fairy tales, and I love when these retellings subvert the expectations of tropes associated with these stories. Fables is definitely in that category of retellings that's all about adding some edge to fairy tales. Characters have dysfunctional relationships with just about everyone else, characters who would never have shown up in the same Disney movie are suddenly having sex, and the happily ever after is kind of besides the point. I don't mind an edgier take on fairy tales. One of my favorite short story collections is The Bloody Chamber by Anne Angela Carter, which casts fairy tales into a much darker light to explore topics like family relationships, war, and of course gender expectations. My issue with fables is that it seems to add all of this edge more for the sake of edge than for anything else, which I just don't find interesting. I think a good edgy take on anything has to have some sort of affection for the original source material, or at least some curiosity for where it comes from. And that's just not something I've ever felt from fables and the few issues I've read, including this book. All of this is to say that Cinderella was fine and fun and all that. The story does build to a conclusion that I thought was an interesting take on Cinderella's life story. But overall, I was just frustrated with this book the way that I've been frustrated with the rest of uh, the Fables books stories that I've read, and so I think this, this is just a take on fairy tale that's just not for me. Up next is a comic book that I also decided to read based on that book riot list, and this is Lady Killer Volume 1 by Joelle Jones and Jamie S. Ritt. Lady Killer is about Josie Schuller, a 1960s housewife who is definitely cast in that Betty Draper mode, but who also has a secret life as a hit woman. Dealing with a chauvinist handler, familiar markers of 1960s domesticity and sexuality as well as her own family life, Josie's already tense balance gets upended when her employers decide that they can easily get rid of her. This book is tons of fun. The contrast between Josie's domestic life and her murderous side job may not be particularly novel, but it is really well executed. The book plays out different images of uh, women making it in the 1960s, from Playboy bunnies to Avon ladies, as cover for Josie's own particular career path. This book is deliberately gruesome to further build that dichotomy between Josie's different lives but it's beautifully drawn in a way that mimics the graphic style of the time. I will definitely be checking out more books in this series, and I really hope to see her story and her family fleshed out further. Moving on from comic books, the next book I'm going to be talking about is Superficial by Andy Cohen. So I am a huge fan of The Real Housewives, which means that like high up on my list of problematic faves is Andy Cohen, the guy who made Real Housewives and so many other Bravo shows a possibility, even dare I say, a reality. I have read all of his books because I am a sucker for any source of Real Housewives gossip, and when he came to Boston last year to promote Superficial, I went to the event and I got a signed copy of the book. Superficial is the second book he's published that's basically a collection of his diaries, the first being the Andy Cohen Diaries, a deep look at a superficial year. Even though I had the hard copy of this book, I hadn't actually gotten around to reading it, but recently I've just been like in a major place of oversaturation when it comes to podcasts, especially on Thursdays when like all of the political podcasts come out. So I've been really getting back into audiobooks, and the ones that I've always loved most are memoirs or nonfiction that are narrated by the writer. Superficial ended up being kind of the perfect antidote to my politics saturation because it's pretty much what it promises in the title, superficial. Andy Cohen usually gets pretty gossipy about the real housewives and celebrities and just the swank life in general. There are fancy vacations and meals and parties with people he only has to refer to, but to by their first name, all set up against major pop culture mom moments like the Met Gala. If you're familiar with Andy Cohen's existence, you're probably aware that his perspective on race is, at best, 
limited. In this book he talks about Ferguson, which is very close to where he's from, as well as the controversy of his own making when he called Amanda Stenberg a jackhole for calling out Miley Cyrus's cultural appropriation. These moments are sometimes, well, frustrating. He does seem to try and grow in relation to the com uh, conversations that are happening around him, but it's not always clear if he actually has. I think it's something to keep in mind, but again, if you're someone who is like engaged with conversations about race and is also picking up one of Andy Cohen's books, you've probably already managed your expectations of him. Alongside these societal and pop culture moments is also Cohen's own moments of introspection as a middle-aged gay man who's trying to figure out things like his family, his home, his dog. Overall, if you're an Andy Cohen fan, this is fun in the ways that you would expect it to be fun. There are references to the New York and Atlanta reunions, there's Brooks lying about cancer in there, Jack's being a total waste, and other memorable Bravo moments. Swinging now to the other end of the intellectual spectrum is Naboka's Favorite Word is Mauve by Ben Blatt. Uh, so this book combines two really awesome things, math and words, and in it Ben Blatt is using math and statistics to analyze literature and other writings, with each chapter focused on different sorts of analyses and topics. He explores questions like do fewer adverbs make for better literature, do authors follow their own writing advice, and how does font size change on covers as writers become more famous. What I really appreciated about this book and Blatt's writing overall is how efficiently and clearly he's able to explain the math. He's able to strike a really great balance where he doesn't get too bogged down by technical details so that even if you're less familiar with the, the methods that he's using or just math in general, you should be able to follow and if you are familiar, you're still like there's still enough detail in there for you to be able to kind of engage with what he's talking about and make your own kind of critiques on what he's doing. Another thing that I really loved about this book is that he incorporates fan fiction into his analysis, which is both fun and really smart because fan fiction is basically an immense data set of words and writing that is also encoded with more data about country of origin and popularity. There are some chapters where the analysis is weaker than others and I think it's very much born out of the same issues that you can get when you're doing computational analysis of any data set, whether it's like words or DNA or I don't know, anything else that's out there. You can get to a point where you're when you're doing this kind of work where you're really just analyzing it for the sake of analyzing it and the surest sign of that is when the analysis becomes very repetitive. You're basically running the same method over and over and over again just with this different data set and you're just repeating the same result over and over and over again. That's definitely something that happens in a few of the chapters here and I think that could have been easy easily solved just by making those chapters shorter or trying to come to a broader kind of conclusion. I do also have some quibbles with the way some of the graphs are illustrated, but those are really a nitpicking criticism just based on the fact that that's something that I have to think about a lot with my own work. This is a book that I think is filled with consistently good explanations, but inconsistently good answers. It is a really fast read though, so I think even with those issues, it's a worthwhile read if you're just looking for a different way to analyze books and words. The next book I want to talk about is 6-4 by Hideo Yokoyama, which is a Japanese book that was translated into English by Jonathan Lloyd Davies. 6-4 is a Japanese crime novel that follows Mikami, a detective who is now the press and media relations director for his precinct. Mikami gets drawn into an old, unsolved kidnapping case that resulted in the murder of a young girl many years earlier, while also trying to find his own runaway daughter. At play is layer upon layer of office politics that hides a deeper secret about the kidnapping case that Mikami is getting drawn into, while also battling against his superiors, the media, and the fears that he and his wife have about their daughter. This book was not on my radar at all, but I've been sort of in a Japanese crime thriller mood lately. My library does one of those lucky day display collections where you can check out a popular book that likely has a super long wait list, um, but the catch is that you only have 14 days to read them. I just I saw this book on the lucky day display case and I was immediately intrigued. This book has apparently gotten quite a few awards and it seems like its translation into English was somewhat anticipated, so I'm glad I got a chance to read it. With that said, I am still figuring out whether or not I like this book, which is probably a sign that I didn't actually understand everything that was going on. This book is quite long, but the pace was really fast and consuming, so I was always intrigued by what was going on and I got through it very quickly. What was really difficult though for me was that half the time 
I didn't know what was happening. And I think this is actually more my own issue for the most part because I am really, really, really bad at characters' names. There are TV shows and books that I love where I do not remember the names of like major characters. And most of the time that's okay, but for books like this one where there's a lot of like politics going on, that that can become a little bit of a detriment to your understanding of anything that's happening. This book also has quite a few names that are similar to each other and maybe because I'm not as familiar with some of these names they just didn't like stick with me. But one of the things that kept me reading was the reviews that said that there was a really big twist towards the end and I have to say that that twist was fascinating. I'm obviously not going to give it away but what I liked about it was that it didn't really hit you over the head, it just kind of crept up on you and crept up on you until you like suddenly realize you're not breathing. I think the book really earns that moment and even if I couldn't follow everything that happened up until that point, I think it was worth reading just to get that emotional impact. Next is the other Japanese crime thriller that I read for this month and this is Confessions by Kanai Minato which was translated into English by Steven Snyder. Confessions starts with Yuko Moriguchi, a teacher and single mom his, whose only child died after drowning in the school's pool. Moriguchi has decided to retire and on her last days she sits down with all of her students to basically reveal to them the identity of the two students among them who killed her daughter. She uses this moment to also enact her revenge against them and the rest of the book follows the consequences of that revenge, with each chapter taking place from the point of view of one of her students, including the ones she accuses of killing her daughter. I picked this book up because I loved Penance, which is also by Kanae Minato, and that I talked about in my last wrap up. Penance and Confessions have many similarities in their themes and structure, but they feel more like companions than redundant books. Confessions is much more of a narrative, with a story that is built out of the consequences of the first chapter and concluded in a way that brings both the plot and the character arcs to a close. Like Penance, Confessions relies heavily on shifts in perspective to give a Rashomon style of unreliable narration that builds to a bigger truth. The effect of this style is very different in these two books. In Penance, the larger truth is a solution to the mystery, but that solution ends up feeling very secondary to the introspection of the chapter. Confessions has that same sense of introspection with each point of view, but that felt very secondary to me to the story that begins to unfold involving one of the accused students. If you're thinking about reading either of these books, I think they're both great. I think they're both worth picking up and I don't know if I could pick a favorite. I would just say if you read one and you like it then also pick up the other. And last for my wrap up is maybe one of my favorite books for the year. This is The Caped Crusade, Batman and the Rise of Nerd Culture by Glenn Weldon. The Caped Crusade covers the history of Batman not just in terms of the history of the character and the artistic property but as a framework to understand how nerd culture and pop culture has evolved in response to changes to in society and technology. Weldon's discussion includes topics like homophobia and fam culture, the dichotomous reception to the Adam West TV show, and the relationship between the internet and the Nolan movies. I listened to this book on audiobook because I am a huge fan of the pop culture happy hour podcast which Glenn Weldon is a part of. Weldon is really amazing at combining historical perspectives with a current understanding of both pop culture and nerd culture. He's like a professor with a really good sense of humor and a love of taxonomies and putting on funny voices. I am not a particularly huge Batman fan, but I love pop culture histories and I love Glenn Weldon's style, so this seemed like a no-brainer, especially because he narrates his own audiobook. Like I said, this is going to be probably one of my favorite books of the year. Even as someone who is not a huge Batman person, this was incredibly interesting to me because Batman is really kind of only a part of the narrative. The other major part of it is fandom in nerds, and what's great about this is that Weldon is very much a self-admitted nerd. I've read discussions of fandom and comic book culture that comes from people who are clearly not, you know, born of those worlds. And sometimes, you know, there's value in those perspectives, but a lot of times those discussions can become very condescending and uninformative. But because Weldon has participated in this culture, he's able to approach it with real insight. And because he also has a general self-awareness, he's able to point out where fandom becomes uh, exclusionary or even at times absurd. He's also just really funny and listening to audiobooks was kind of like listening to my dad talk about his favorite scientific discoveries if my dad was also able to do impressions of Edward Jenner. 
uncovering the smallpox vaccine. So I highly recommend this book if you're looking for some kind of nonfiction or comic book discussion, and I would definitely also recommend the audiobook as well. I think it's a fairly quick audiobook, so I think it's perfect if you're looking for something kind of low-key but also engaging and informative. Um, so yeah, that's my wrap-up for August. I hope you also had a really good reading month in August, and you also have some good reading going on in September, and yeah, thank you for watching, and bye!